Well, thank you very much. And I would certainly like to commend everyone who has been so energized and industrious and seeking for knowledge to be here at this hour of morning with your lattes, mates, and espressos. And that gets us into the concept of those various nutritional and other metabolic support factors that can be used to enhance neurochemistry. And if there's a particular point that I'm going to make through this presentation, that it is highly ideal to feed before you flog, which means that in any metabolic system, and the brain is a highly developed biochemical system with very well characterized chemistry, that the requirement for certain substrates to build those pathways and metabolic cofactors to convert those components into the optimum forms is the first place to start. And often, it's the last intervention that's done. So I'm going to describe as a model Parkinson's disease, define the basic chemistry of it, which of course relates to dopamine, and then define how supporting the other neurochemistries around that, as well as reducing cortisol, can create a synergistic combination that can create very dramatic and very rapid benefits. Then at the end, I will provide a general summary of the sorts of results that we've been seeing, as well as a few best case presentations. Now, the classic triad of Parkinson's, of course, is rigidity, akinesia, and tremor. There are an additional series of features that go along with it that are related to the neurochemical dysfunction. So there is mask-like faces, fascinating gait, stooped posture, micrography, diminished phonation, depression, dementia, and a tendency to diminishing response to pharmaceutical therapy. And of course, the specific region of the brain that is involved is a so-called substantia nigra. As you recall from your neuroanatomy, that means the black substance because it literally is naturally dark to the dopaminergic neurons. And the general region of the brain is called the corpus striatum. A PET scan of a normal brain versus Parkinson's shows a tremendous diminution of glucose uptake and metabolism in the steroidal region. So just looking at this picture gives the indication that there may be less cellular mass as well as there may be accumulated toxicity which is preventing those cells from functioning normally. And both of those can be addressed. So the pathophysiological relationships, those factors that have been found to be highly correlated with the development of the condition, of course, is an oxidative stress that is damaging to the dopaminergic neurons. There is a tremendous depletion of glutathione in the nerves that has a large series of consequences. And we'll describe particularly the effects of glutathione administered in the typical way intravenously, or in the more novel way we'll describe, which is sublingually. CoQ10 levels are markedly reduced in the Parkinsonian brain, and delivering high-dose CoQ10 would only improves symptoms that appears to actually reduce the rate of progression of the disease more effectively than the pharmaceutical agents. There's an association with low-dose cumulative insecticides and pesticides in the brain, particularly synergistic low doses of a multitude of different organic compounds. Heavy metals are related. Persons with a high sugar intake have a three-fold increased incidence. High animal fat ingestion, a five-fold increase in incidence. And physical trauma, such as observed in Muhammad Ali, dance like a butterfly, sting like a bee. And the cumulative trauma from that sport resulted in the once agile fighter 
having more of this so-called post-traumatic Parkinson symptoms. Now, this is quite counterintuitive, but studies have shown that drinking two or more cups of coffee a day substantially reduces the risk of Parkinson's disease. In terms of supplementation, perhaps the single most impressive nutrient in the effects and effectiveness is the enhancement of glutathione levels. As stated, the neurons in Parkinson's have a dramatic reduction of glutathione. And as you know, glutathione has a sulfhydryl group from the cysteine residue of the tripeptide. And the loss of glutathione, which is perhaps the single most important intracellular antioxidant, results in significant free radical stress and oxidative injury. In addition, glutathione chelates heavy metals, protect cell membranes, and may help detoxify pesticides and other toxins. Now, I enjoyed the last session of this meeting hearing Dr. Perlmutter, who's one of the pioneers in IV glutathione therapy. And I was incredibly impressed when I saw his videotapes of Parkinsonian patients who were fairly severe in their symptomatic patterns, moving very slowly, got an injection of intravenous glutathione. It was typically 600 milligrams in. Current protocols go up to as high as 800 to 1,500 milligrams. And literally, within 5 to 10 minutes of getting the injection, you saw the person almost melt into near-normal activity that rapidly. and virtually all the symptoms of Parkinson's were significantly improved. The drawbacks to intravenous glutathione are the drawbacks of virtually any medicament or nutrient that is given intravenously. The need for access, intravenously repeated injections, the potential for the usual intravenous access complications. There are formulation problems. There may be lack of sterility of the preparation, or there can be an accurate uh, filling of the particular compounding formula. And there can tend to be a diminishing effectiveness of symptom reduction after the injection until the next administration. So the work that we've done as an innovation in this arena and one which I'll describe towards the end, at least in brief, a technology that we have added to this, which is the use of lasers in a particular way to modify the shape, structure, and function of molecules to make particular nutrients more effective milligram for milligram. This is the same technology that in the introduction was described that in in vitro studies shows the ability to attract stem cells. Of course, it requires different wavelengths and modulations for that effect. And as perhaps a look of things to come in the future of more high-level physics and laser physics-related modalities, I'll describe some of the potential of that for new degeneration and other conditions. So sublingual glutathione has a series of advantages. It's easy to administer. IV access is not required. It's considerably less expensive, far more convenient, uh, no IV-related complications. It allows a more sustained and consistent level, so the subjects can have a more sustained and consistent relief of symptoms. So instead of getting the big dose of glutathione and they have a near normal level of mobility for 24 to 48 hours, and then gradually they wind down to the next dose. This allows the ability to titrate a dose to get a consistent level of relief over time. 